So right now you are single and you say yeah. you're on the dating streets, if you will. <laughs> and you said in order to be Hilarious. a great data, yeah. you need to be a great evaluator. Yes. So how do we start to evaluate the person that we're dating to actually know if they're right for us or not? Yeah, so first and foremost, you know, being back on the dating streets, you know, <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's it's still a moment. I'm still, I never saw this moment of my life, right? Like nobody, you know, goes into marriage planning for a divorce. So, you know, coming out of, you know, my divorce, having to reorient my life, rebuild my life, rewrite my life, you know, part of that is, you know, dating, right? But for me, what I had to learn first before evaluating someone, I had to spend more time evaluating me. And so that's that's part of it. So often we are looking at evaluating others and do they belong or not. And that's important. And definitely I'll get to that. But the first evaluation has to be of self, of me. You know, what are the areas that I really need to heal? What is the mirror of life reflecting to me about what's going on internally? You know, what are the areas where I feel like, you know what, I could grow a little bit more? What did my last relationship teach me about my tendency to be in cycles with people that bring the worst out of me instead of the best? So it's the evaluation first of me. Because when I don't evaluate myself or when someone doesn't evaluate who they are, it really inhibits their ability to then evaluate someone else. Because if I'm not evaluating me, then I'm going to be a poor evaluator of you. Because if I can't look at myself in the mirror, then I'm definitely not going to look at you in the mirror. I'm going to look at what I want to see. And if I see certain things that don't align with how I want you to be, either I'm just going to have cognitive dissonance, tune those things out. Oh, that's not a red flag. That's a white flag. Like, because I'm not good at evaluating me. So that is where it starts. And that's where I've had to learn like, okay, Devon, you got to retrace your steps. How did you get here? You know, what, what do you need to know about you? Focus there first. And then as you're doing that, that's going to create a better lens to evaluate who belongs in my life and who doesn't. And that part of that evaluation process is identifying what my core beliefs are. And I think a lot of times, you know, we have this belief that, you know, love is enough. And I don't believe that it is. It's not. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not pessimistic about love. I got it written on my arm, okay? Love wins. Oh my God, you do. <laughs> yes, yes. So, you know, I'm, I'm, full, I'm, I'm all in on love. I, I'm not cynical about it at all. I just know that at the end of the day, you know, love is not enough to overcome differences in core beliefs. And, and that's an area of evaluation, which is critical. And, you know, I see so many people miss it because they say, well, I love this person or we have great chemistry and all that's wonderful. And at the end of the day, a relationship can be whatever two people want it to be. Uh, so there's not like one blanket statement, but in terms of best practices in this area, what I've learned is like, wait a minute, if there are differences in core beliefs, then fundamentally there may be major differences in the relationship that may prevent it from working. So evaluating first, well, what are my core beliefs? What do, what do I really want out of life? What is, you know, inconsequential and what's consequential for me? What's important and what's not important? As I know that, then I'm going to be able to better evaluate like, oh, this person actually is in alignment with my core beliefs. Cool. There's some things that we have disagreements on, but it's not my, it's not the core of what I really need to have in a person based upon who I am. So that evaluation starts there. It starts identifying what are my core beliefs and then not compromising those. Because when you start spending time with someone, this is someone, this is something I would also say, okay? Like, as soon as you can identify someone's core beliefs, identify it. And if there's not an alignment, I would, or I would challenge anyone, stop it right then. Because what happens is you start to like somebody, you get involved, you get invested, you get emotionally attached. And the same difference in core beliefs was there day one as day 100. And if maybe certain questions would have been asked earlier, you would have said, oh, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you're cute, but I'm not going to do that, <laughs> you know? And so in my dating experience, I've had to, you know, bump my head, right? Because as like, you know, coming out of a divorce, like coming out of war, you know, not because it was contentious. It just means that it, you exert so much emotional energy and mental energy. And so coming out of it, you know, I wasn't a great evaluator, you know, not that I was dating um, women that weren't great women in their own right. They just may not have been right for me. Um, but I wasn't a great evaluator because I wasn't evaluating myself. And so as I became, began to do more work on me, I began to realize like, oh, wow, right. I can't just spend time with just anybody. I can't just give my time to someone just because they're attractive. You know, I need to do a little bit better job of evaluating, is there a core belief connection? And if there is, 
continue to get to know the person. And if there isn't, say, hey, you know what? You're, you're attractive, but you're probably for someone else. You know, when it comes to evaluating those core beliefs, I fundamentally look at, looked at it like this. What are the things that I believe that are not subject to modification? Okay, give me them. Okay, so faith, you know, I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. you know, believe in God, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ is my Savior, my Lord and Savior. Uh, and I also, you know, preach, you know, and I minister. So that's a big part of my life, you know, that's critical. So if somebody doesn't share that belief, that may be very difficult for that to work because at the end of the day, what I've noticed is that if you don't have alignment in your spirituality, your spirituality becomes your lifestyle. And if there's a difference in lifestyle, then it's going to be really hard for two to become one because we can't become one necessarily because there's a difference in how we want to live life and how we believe life. And now and again, two people can try to figure it out. But from what my observations have been, if there's a disconnect in the spirituality, there usually tends to be a disconnect in the relationship. So faith is one of them. You know, the other thing for me is, uh, you know, I was raised in a, in a family where my father was an alcoholic. You know, my father died when I was nine years old of a heart attack when he was 36. So sobriety is one of my core values, period. End of story, like it just is. And I know we live in a, you know, a culture where uh, so in some in some areas, you could probably say not being sober is probably celebrated mm -hmm. in some level, you know, just in terms of what's in the culture. And, and it's like, oh, yeah, take this, drink that, smoke that, eat this, all of these things that kind of take us out of our reality. And I don't judge anyone, uh, you know, based upon whatever their consumption is. But when you're talking about compatibility for me, you know, those are things that I, I don't value, that I don't want someone to value. Like, I wouldn't share my life with someone who doesn't value sobriety. Like, that's a core belief, given what I've been through. And again, not projecting on anyone, but like, fundamental. Uh, the other part for me, which is a core belief, is, and this seems like a crazy one to me, but it's true. You know, it's like, uh, there used to be this saying that uh, happy wife, happy life. Oh God, that drives right? me nuts. It's crazy, crazy. No. If you want a happy life, marry a happy wife. Meaning, is that person themselves already content? Is that person themselves already happy? You know, are they already optimistic? Do they have a, a positive mindset? That mindset is essential. And mindset for me, you know, is one of my core beliefs, like keeping my mind, you know, clear, focused, positive, optimistic. This is essential versus someone who may have a, a, a belief that, well, you know, life isn't good or things always happen to me. That That's your belief. But for me, I want someone who really has a positive disposition and we can connect on that. Because at the end of the day, it's our mindset that ultimately can control or disrupt or contribute to compatibility. So those are three areas for me that I look at. I love that. How did you actually then come up with this? And so if someone's listening right now, you have such clarity, yeah. which I love. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't have that much clarity, though, in what their core belief is. When you then became single and started doing this work, how did you come to that clarity? Um, you know through bumping my head a little bit, you know what I mean? Like, I think the first part of it, and this again may sound crazy, it's like, you know, I'm the middle child of three boys. And so, you know, I was in, in the way that I came up in life, you know, I, growing up, I mean, I, I had a lot of, um, what's the word? I was very stubborn, very headstrong, but I would say I was also, you know, insecure. And so I found my security through achievement. And you know, being on the honor roll, playing sports, being in the being in the student plays, uh, you know, getting straight A's. Like the more achievement I, I got, the more comfortable I felt. And so now that seems fine on the surface, but the problem is I didn't have that security within me. So I needed something external to support, supplement, and subsidize what is actually internal, which is esteem. So as I got older, you know, I applied that to my professional life and achieving and doing this and getting this and having that and becoming, you know, the persona that people who know me know of me, right? Like I put a lot of energy into that, but at the expense of putting that into myself and believing that about myself, that I am great, that I am worthy, that I am enough, independent of anything that I do or achieve. So I didn't have that. So coming out of the marriage, I had to really look at the gap that was existing, right, in, in my spirit, in my soul, that like, oh, the achievement could not fill. So it first started with me saying, I'm actually 
worthy enough and valuable enough to do the things that I need to do to bridge the gap internally. So often we don't do the, do those things or we don't like evaluate well because we don't feel worthy ourselves. Mm. Well, who am I to say I have these standards? Who am I to tell someone that if, I, if they don't meet certain requirements, it's not gonna work? Who am I? No, I don't wanna, I don't. And then what happens is we compromise and we end up with people that times don't work when we could have just said, I'm worthy enough to make great choices for my life. I'm worthy enough to know who I am. I'm worthy enough to know what I want. And, I'm, and I feel good about myself enough that I'm gonna advocate for myself. Instead of worrying about, am I gonna upset someone? No, I'm gonna be respectful, but I gotta let you know that this is who I am. These are the things that work for me. And if they don't work for you, that's okay. But it starts with a sense of self-worth. I mean, that's really what, what came, uh, birthed this, this message that I've come, you know, been preaching and talking about lately, being one of one, you know? And this idea that no matter, you know, our relationship status, that we're, we're all single. Right? We're all individuals. We're all one of one. And so often we look at like, oh, getting in a relationship will improve my happiness, my health, my wellness. And that's a myth. Because if I am not happy now, I won't be happy in a relationship. And so often the culture is like, get into a relationship, get into a relationship, you know, get married. What about getting into a relationship with yourself? What about learning to love yourself? What about looking in the mirror and loving who looks back at you? What about looking in the mirror and saying, I'm worthy, I'm valuable, I'm valued. Whether I'm with someone or not, I am valued just because of who I am and, and who I was created to be. So for me, it first started there. Mm -hmm. It's an inside job. I had to rebuild my esteem. I had to rebuild my self-esteem. I had to really say, Devon, you are worthy of the best. You are worthy uh, to have your beliefs, to share your beliefs with someone who shares you know, your beliefs. You are worthy to be able to have standards that you don't compromise on. That's okay. That's all right. And so I had to do that work first. I had to first know that I was worthy and then I had to evaluate, okay, what are the deal breakers for me? And then once I knew those deal breakers, then I began to, you know, incorporate how I evaluated people as I was evaluating myself. And so with someone who is trying to figure out, you know, how do I evaluate, you first got to make sure that you are worthy and that you know that and that you don't make any bones about it. This is, this is who I am. Yeah, I'm one of one. I'm, I'm unique. There's nobody else on the earth like me. So yeah, I have certain things that I need my life to be. And if somebody doesn't wanna share my life with me because of those things, God bless them, pray for them as they go. But don't compromise on what's core for you. Did you just then repeat that? Because there's that moment where you don't necessarily feel worthy, because I hear the message, it's so strong, but there's that gap, as you said, between saying that you're worthy and then actually feeling worthy. Yeah. So how did you fill that gap in order to then do the work? Uh, well, therapy. You know, uh, um, you know, consistently in therapy, life coaching, uh, reading, journaling, praying, meditation, uh, you know, watching sermons, you know, watching different talks, mm -hmm. like doing the work on me. That's how I bridge the gap and still bridging the gap. It's a, it's a, you know, perpetual bridging, right? Because there are some days I wake up and I'm like, oh, you know, what's going on and who am I? And, you know, and I don't feel the way I want to feel. And so I was like, okay, my mindset's not right. I gotta get my mind right. I gotta get back into a remembrance of who I am and what I'm about, what's possible for me. And so that that's the work that I have done and continue to do to be able to bridge that gap. And that was, uh, you know, the intensity of the work certainly, you know, I think is what allow, has allowed me to get clear because, you know, you can get really clear in life relative to the pain you've been through. You know, pain brings a lot of clarity if we choose to accept it. A lot of times when we go through pain, especially emotional pain, I know that, you know, the pain that I went through, you know, I, 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 I was very clear, you know, like, oh, you gotta get really clear about how you wanna live life, Javon, in the direction you wanna go in. Now, I had to choose accepting that clarity. I could have easily said, well, you know, how did this happen? And just, you know, continue to pour over how it, why it didn't work and all that, but it's like, or blame the other person. Or blame the other person, right? And it's like, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna own my side of the street. I'm gonna evaluate me. What do I need to learn from this so that I can apply the clarity that the pain has produced and be able to make you know, decisions that work for me going forward. Wow, okay, so you've 
It's so profound. So you've now feeling worthy to yeah. then do the work. Yep. Then you identify all the things that you've said. These are the things that are basically my non non negotiables sure. that are super important to me. Then how do you um, start to use that? Remember it as you start to go on the dating field because there's the doing the work. And I've just seen a lot of people do this. And I have myself before I met my husband, where it's like I do the work and then I find another guy and then the work starts to unravel again. <laughs> right, right. Well, in my experience, um, you know, one of the ways for the work to not unravel is to not attach anyone else's benefit to the work. Mm. Like, so a lot of times, especially in this world of dating, in this world of relationships, this world of self-help, a lot of it, the undertone is, if you do these things, then you will get this person. Right. And so I think that's a slippery slope because then my intent is not for the betterment of self, it's to manipulate myself enough to get somebody to come into my life. It's to change me enough so I can be, you know, uh, uh, acceptable to someone else. And I think that then, because I, because there's not as much integrity as there could be in that mentality. So if I'm doing the work because I want to get somebody, okay, when I get somebody, I'm going to become who they want me to be. Because I didn't choose who I wanted to be to begin with. So to me, so much of that work has to be anchored in who I want to be or who you want to be or whomever the individual wants to be. This is who you want to be. It's not about whoever comes to choose you because of that has nothing to do with anyone else. That's when I say, hey, you're, you're one of one. This is about you. This is about who you are, what type of life you want, the love that you wanna have in yourself first. How am I out here looking for love and I'm not looking for myself? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work. So that to me is, is one way to mitigate, you know, finding you know, someone kind of becoming who someone wants them to be by really having a sense of this is who I am because I'm doing that work because this is who I wanna be. I want to harness the best of me to live life moment to moment in a way that is content versus like, I'm not content. So I'm making these changes because I believe contentment is found in connection or commitment. So I believe contentment is found in commitment. So as a result, I'm trying to become more content so I can get a commitment from somebody. But at the end of the day, it's about just being content for contentment's sake. Mm -hmm. Because if I can be content all by myself, within myself, it really doesn't even matter if I'm in a relationship. That's cool. I can share that with someone else, but I don't need that other person to, to be help me be content because I'm already doing that work. Yeah, Ooh, that's so strong. And then I've also heard talking about the manipulation, how that really hit me when you said you're almost manipulating yourself. Yeah. I've also heard you say that when you don't feel worthy and you're almost like trying to chase or trying to become someone that someone else wants, you then leave yourself open to their manipulation. That's right. Talk to me about that. Yeah, because see so often, you know, when we're hungry, Right. Think about this. So like when we're when we're satisfied in terms of, you know, being uh, like, say, we're full. Right. We've gone somewhere. We're eating. We're great. Everything's cool. Like attitude's cool. Mindset's good. We can go shopping and buy what we need, not just everything that we see. But wait until we get hungry. And what happens when we get hungry? We don't think as clearly. We make irrational decisions. We buy stuff we don't need. We overeat. We overcompensate. Same thing happens in dating. When we are so hungry for love and we're so hungry for someone else and we just want a commitment and we just want to get married so badly, what happens? We tend to make irrational decisions. That, that hunger becomes an, an avenue to be exploited because someone else, even though they may not articulate it, they can say, oh, this person is hungry. So then what happens? That person that identifies that hunger is going they're going they're going to manipulate even if they don't want to mm -hmm. because in that dynamic you're coming into it oh, you're the one that's here to fill me well no no one else can fill us the only one that can fill us is ourselves and god that's it people can make contributions but fundamentally if i'm relying on someone else to satisfy my hunger that person is going to say well wait i i'm not capable to be your source i can't do that but what happens oh well you know what if you want to hang with me, fine. I'm, I'll, I'll call you back when I want to call you. I'll reach out when I want to reach out. And the person that's so hungry will say, okay, that's fine. Okay, well, you know, the person doesn't phone, return a phone call for two weeks. Then they call, oh yeah, I'll go out with you. That's what I mean by being open to manipulation. 
because that hunger is so strong that it's drowning out sound wisdom, it's drowning out rational thinking, it's drowning out self-worth. And I'm saying, hey, don't allow your hunger to betray you. It's okay for us to say, you know, I would like companionship. That's very different than I need companionship. That need is like, I'm hungry for it. That, uh, you know, that want is more like, okay, yeah, I would love that at the right time. Because when we're full, we say, hey, I'm going to eat again. I'll eat when I'm ready. I'm not out here like, oh my goodness, I'm hungry. I'm just going to go eat some, you know, fast food or something I know I shouldn't eat, but I'm so hungry. I need to fill that. So no, I'm not that. I'm not in that place. So that's what I mean, you know, by us being open to manipulation when we are too hungry for love. I love that analogy so much. It was, I was thinking about like a chocolate cake, yeah. right? Because it's like, it tastes <laughs> lovely. It's like that, that, that person may seem great, yeah. but if you're hungry, it's going to feel that momentary happiness. But the long-term happiness, it actually is more detrimental to you. Absolutely. But then that, but that goes back to what we've been talking about. So we go back to the first question about evaluation. So let's mm. use a chocolate mm. cake, right? So if I'm hungry and I don't have a strong sense of self, mm -hmm. I look at the cake and say, I know I could be healthier. I know I want to be fit. But what difference does it make? You know, that's kind of hard work. And the last time I worked out and tried to get on a diet, I, you know, it didn't work. And I'm just not, you know, I just have no discipline. And you know what? Like, I'm just going to eat this to make myself feel good. I know it's not good, but I want to feel good. So I'm usually going to turn to something bad to make me feel good when things are maybe a little upside down internally. So we eat that chocolate cake and it brings a momentary satisfaction. But what is it actually satisfying? It's satisfying the lower part of who we are, not the higher part. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. And so we bring people into our lives that are like chocolate cake. Like, oh man, in that moment it was great. And you know, the vibe was good and the energy was good and the attraction was good and all that. But I know they're not right for me but they satisfy my hunger in the moment. So I'll compromise myself and be with this person. But then what happens? The bill always comes due. So we eat the chocolate cake and the moment we eat the chocolate cake, we don't see the ramifications of it. Right, right now we can go eat chocolate cake, look in the mirror, everything's great. Mm -hmm. Give it a day or two. Ooh, my face, it's a little puffy, you know, then my stomach, why? Because the bills always, always come due. So when we allow people into our life, you know, that are like that chocolate cake, they're good in the moment, but not good long term. In the moment, it feels good. But over time, we pay for it. And where do we pay for it the most? Emotionally, mentally, physically sometimes, right? Spiritually. That person that we know, oh, it's so good in the moment, but ah, they don't really share my values and they kind of, you know, treat me less than I want to be treated. But when we have those moments, they're so good. Is it worth it? And this is why I go back to a point I made earlier, you know, pain not only produces clarity, but it's also life's greatest teacher if we allow it to be. And so the pain of relationships and, and being mistreated or not, you know, owning value, at a certain point that pain gets so great that I would hope someone would look in the mirror and say, I gotta make some changes. You know, I love chocolate cake, but I can't keep allowing my diet to be run by my love for chocolate cake. You know, I've got to have a diet that is healthier for me, not just for who I am now, but who I'm becoming. So how in those moments, though, because there's three types of people, someone who then runs away, never eats the chocolate cake again, um, but goes to the extreme. So, for instance, there's people that um, in my audience, especially like they've just been hurt so much in a relationship that they close the door to dating and relationships for good because they're like, well, it's no good. It's never worked out for me. So I'm never dating again. All men are garbage. And... To your point, it's like, well, don't starve yourself. No, 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 there are healthy foods out there for you, right? Same with them. There are other lovely, amazing humans out there that you can find. But people sometimes swing hard and close the door 
Um, or to your point where they just feel like, well, this is all that I've got. So it's better than having yeah, a chocolate cake right, than right, starving. Right. right. Um, so how have you been able to almost be that third point that's in the middle that's looking for that nutrition of the heart, if you yeah, will, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and not swinging in either direction? Yeah, you know, uh, a couple of things. Um, it comes down to accurate thinking. So, you know, when you say, oh my goodness, you know, I've been hurt by love so much, like I'm just not gonna date, you know, okay, that's one side. And then the other side is like, well, this is the best that I can get, right? I think both are fundamentally founded in inaccurate thinking. So when it comes to this idea of like, well, I've been hurt so much, I'm just gonna close myself off to love. I say, okay, well, let's, let's pause here. I believe, you know, there's a scripture that says that all things work together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And so I have a fundamental belief that all things are working for our good. So recently I uh, had to do a eulogy for a man who was kind of like my grandfather. No, it's okay. You know, I mean, he suffered for a while, but, you know, definitely miss him. And so he had this, this statement, if you ever, you, whatever you asked him, hey, how are you doing? He would say, I'm living in the blessings. Didn't matter, he, you know, he suffered from multiple myeloma and you know, neuropathy, and no matter how much pain he was in, if ever you would ask him, you know, how are you feeling? He would say, I'm living in the blessings. And so during his eulogy, you know, I talked about living in the blessings means you know, living in God's goodness. You know, follow me, I'm going somewhere, I'm answering the first question, which is you know, I can make a decision that everything happening for me is for my good, or, I can live as if it's not. And when I live as if it's not, it actually works against me instead of living as if it is. And so there was a story that I found as I was preparing the eulogy, and it was about this, uh, this king who would go out hunting with his best friend. And so his best friend would always load the guns. And his best friend had a statement, this is good. He would always say, this is good, no matter what it was, this is good. So he loads the gun, he gives it to the king, and the king shoots, but the, the friend made a mistake. And so the king loses his thumb. So he loses his thumb and the king gets mad and he throws his friend in jail because the friend said, no, this is good. And the king's like, no, it's not good. I'm, I don't have a thumb, right? <laughs> so, he, so he throws him in jail. The king goes, he's hunting in a place where he's not supposed to hunt. Cannibals are there. They capture the king. They uh, tie him up and they're gonna eat him. As right when they're getting ready to eat him, they look and they see that he doesn't have a thumb. And they had a superstition that they would only eat people that were whole. So they let him go. And he comes out and he's like, wait a minute. If I didn't have the thumb, okay, so he goes to the, his friend in jail and he says, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, uh, you were right, I should have never put you in here. And, and the friend said, no, you put him in here was great. And he's like, this is good. He said, what are you talking about? How was this good? He said, because if I was not here, I would have been with you. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I would have been with you and, and I wouldn't be here now. Me. That's yeah, right, yeah. I wouldn't be here right now. So he said, this is good. Yeah. So I go back to the, the part of the question of the person with the closed heart and having gone through pain and having gone through heartache, you know, all things work for our good. Can you get to the place where you say, okay, not what I wanted, but this is good because here's what I learned from it. I learned this about myself. I learned that here are areas that I can improve. And then I apply what I've learned to who I am now to then become a better evaluator. The worst thing we can do is to allow the pain we've been through to close us off. We are love, God is love. We are made in his image. So we are truly the image of, of love. And, and even though we all go through heartbreaks, we all go through heartaches, take the time needed to heal and to process that, but please don't close to love because love is all we got. All this, this beautiful set, this all goes away, but love is eternal. And so I would encourage someone to say, you know what, this is good, it's working for my good, and I'm gonna remain open to what love and life has to bring me. For the person that is feeling like, well, wait a minute, this is all I can get, it goes back to, to that self-worth. It goes back to that self-esteem, right? If I do not believe the best about myself, I won't choose the best for myself, period. And so this idea of scarcity, how, anybody looking to, look in, the, in the sky lately? Is there a scarcity of, of stars? No, we, we, we live in a world where, I mean, the impossible happens every day. We're in a planet that's spinning in the middle of the space. Like, and you're telling me this, this scarcity, is there a scarcity of air? No, no, there's not. So it goes back to inaccurate thinking. If I believe there's a scarcity of, 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 of people available to me, then I'm gonna choose 
less than what, what I'm capable of. And that is part of, I think, where the culture sometimes win when it comes to dating, specifically as it relates to men and women. As men, we're taught there's tons of options. As women, there's, there's a, a, taught that, a thought that's, well, you have to be careful. There's not as many, there's not a lot of good men out there. Well, the moment someone buys into that, no matter how many bad men they've dated, no matter how, if they buy into there's not a lot of good men, then they're gonna compromise and they're gonna date somebody who's not a good person, who may not be good for them, but they believe this is all I'm gonna get. And I say, no, 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 no. Live in the belief that the best is available to you. All you have to do is wait for it, period. The best, the best person, the best life, the best job, it's, it is all there. And the only, the only obstacle to it is my impatience, or my insecurity, or my lack of self-worth, or my inaccurate thinking. Oh, wow, that's so good. <laughs> um, and going to the point about waiting for then something to come, um, I've heard you say, like, people go looking, and instead of looking, we need to be receiving. Yeah. A lot of times it's like, oh, you know, uh, are you looking for love? Yes, I'm looking for love. So when I look for something, I acknowledge the absence of it. So I'm actually not living in the energy that I've received it. I'm living in the energy that I don't have it. So when I'm looking, right, I believe that when we're looking for something, it, we sometimes then are open to the manipulation of someone that takes advantage of us looking. When I say, uh, talk about love, I say, don't go look for love, but be ready to receive it. Ready to allow it to come into your life. Ready to allow it to come into your heart. Because the position of receiving is much stronger than I'm looking. I'm looking, okay, because that implies, well, are you, know, are you desperate? Are you insecure about it? Versus like, no, I'm confident and I'm ready to receive love. And I am believing the same way that, you know, you look at radio or a radio antenna or Wi-Fi, like it's receiving a signal. You, it don't have to go looking for, you know, the satellite don't go look for itself. It's like, no, I'm ready to receive the signal. The same way we do that, you know, with the phone. It's like, oh, I'm looking for something. No, you don't, just turn on your phone. It will identify the signal in the environment and we'll receive it. That's what I mean. Instead of looking for love, be ready to receive it. I love that. And it puts you in a position of strength instead of like a lot of women specifically, I don't want to speak for men, um, I just speak for myself. Yeah. I, um, when, when you're giving yourself over, it really is like you're giving your power away as well. And I think that that can, when you're looking and you're trying in that, almost like that feel of franticness, like sure. almost like, you know, is is he the one, right? That that idea of the pressure right. of is he the one, or I found the one, yeah. then it makes you believe, A, that there's no, to, you said it earlier, the scarcity mindset, yeah. right? Now makes you believe that, oh my God, I have to make this one work. Yeah. Um, and then it actually also allow, uh not forces you, but entices you to give your power over to them. And I think that that's where the manipulation piece can come in. Absolutely. Um, but there's this fine line between like the idea of somebody and then the fantasy of somebody. <laughs> and I've actually got a quote of yours that you said. Yes. Acknowledge reality instead of trying to create a fantasy based upon the delusion that someone is showing you. <laughs> yes. Well, here's what I mean by that. So a lot of times, when we're dating, you know, or evaluating, we're, we're doing it because we have an image in our head of we, what we think we want, need, or what we want someone to be like. And we think of like, okay, here's the ideal partner, right? So we have that image. So as a result, that image, it's great, but it also works against us in my experience and in my opinion. So when you meet somebody, you know, let's say there's a disconnect in core beliefs, but there's a lot of other things that work well. That image of what we want or who we want them to be, the fantasy becomes what we focus on. And we're focusing on trying to get this person to meet the fantasy we've created, instead of acknowledging the reality that they're showing you that there's, it's not a fit, it's not a match. The things that you want, the things that you need, and the image that you have is not that, it's not them. And so as a result, that fantasy and wanting someone to become something or be something creates a delusion within us because we're looking at someone instead of appreciating who they are for the person they are, we're trying to turn them into the person we want them to be based upon our image and our fantasy. And that's what makes us delusional. So I'm saying when you're dating, del being delusional is a liability. Reserve the ability to see someone clearly. And that may mean putting your fantasy to the side. And now what I mean by that is, I can have core beliefs about what work for me, 
but be completely open to what love needs to look like. Instead of saying, you know, she's got to come in this package and she's got to be this and she's got to look like this and she's got to be that and all this kind of stuff. No, here are my core beliefs. I want someone who's going to share those beliefs and let me be open to receive however that comes into my life versus this idea of like, she needs to look like this. She needs to talk like that. She needs to wear this. She needs to be from this kind of family. All of these things. So then I meet somebody and I'm trying to make them into my fantasy instead of just appreciating who they are. And I see so much that happening so often in relationships. And that's also where, you know, I believe that uh, people mistake commitment for control. Ooh, tell me more. Just because you're committed to someone doesn't mean you control them. And so often it's like, oh, well, now that we're committed, I can tell you what to wear, what to, what, what to say, where to go, who to hang out with, who not to hang out with, what time to be home, all of these things, because that goes back to the fantasy, right? Like, oh, when I was coming up, this was my idea of what a good marriage is. So I want you to become that versus saying, well, wait, we're committed, but I don't control you. You don't control me. Why don't we together, looking at reality, identify what works best? instead of holding each other hostage to a fantasy that will never become. A lot of us, um, we abandon ourselves once we find somebody that maybe becomes the person that we think we want in life. Yeah. So A, how do we make sure that we don't abandon ourselves? Yeah. Um, and then B, how do we know when we've met somebody, whether it's the fantasy kicking in or it's the reality that you see? So as we were talking about the fantasy sure. and the reality, it reminded me of the story that you told where a woman reached out to you and she seemed so lovely. <laughs> keep, and... going. keep going. <laughs> I think you know where this story is going, Devon. Oh, we'll see, Lisa. Okay, keep going. I'm listening. <laughs> so you're like, she's so lovely. We're talking. We're having fun. And then I'll let you take the story away. Oh, man. Listen, dating is not for the faint of heart, okay? <laughs> All right? It just isn't, especially in this day and age. So the Cliff Notes version was, you know, we had, we had met, you know, uh, online, you know, uh, through, uh, I think it was Instagram at the time. And then she was like, hey, you know, I'm on Snapchat. I was like, cool. You know, I didn't even, I had a Snapchat account, but I never knew Snapchat. So, you know, I went on Snapchat. We were, you know, chatting back and forth, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you'd already done the core beliefs. I'd already done work. the core beliefs, but, but I wasn't as strong in it as I was now. But at that time, I was hungry. Mm -hmm. I was hungry. I was hungry for companionship. I was hungry, you know, I just came out of a, almost a 10 year, you know, relationship, 10 year marriage. So being alone, being by myself, like that, I, these, these are things I never even thought I was going to have to deal with anymore. So that hunger, open me to manipulation. So, you know, she would be like, okay, you know, I would like, hey, let's FaceTime. She's like, okay, great. Now, mind you, we probably talked, you know, just on the phone, you know, text probably for, I don't know, a month or so. And then I was like, wait, no, we need to see each other. Okay, great. Let's FaceTime. Okay, so she, she said, yeah, let's do it tomorrow. Cool. I call her the next day, ghost me for days. And I'm like, ah, oh, what's, I don't understand what's going on. And I'm worried and wondering. So then, so then a couple days later, she reappears and had an excuse. And I said, oh, okay. And here I am, hungry, just going right back into it. Okay, no problem. We talk again for days, days. And then I say, hey, we need to FaceTime. Like, I, I don't know who you are. Like, we've, I need to just at least see your face. Yeah, no problem. We'll do it. I call her the next day. Goes to me for over a week. Oh, I'm sorry. I had problems with my phone, da, da, da. And I pick back up. I keep talking because I'm hungry, okay? Again, like anything I talk about, I'm not saying it because it sounds good. I'm telling you what I've been through, right? I'm telling you the mistakes that I've made because I was so hungry and I didn't have a, a strong enough sense of self-worth to be an evaluator, right? This is the person I am now. The moment someone doesn't want to be seen, we're done. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not gonna, I don't have time for this. Like, no, whatever you're hiding, that's on you. But when I was hungry, when I wasn't really you know, completely confident in my self-belief that I was open to manipulation and open to dealing with something that is, was absolutely crazy. So long story short, you know, we started talking again after, you know, she goes to me for whatever that was for a week or so. And we keep talking. She's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to, you know, come out. Uh, I got to come out to LA for my job. Cool. You know, I'd love to see you. Cool. Made plans. Talked to her the whole time. Never happened. 
Okay, so my point through this whole story. Was it like her grandfather died, she said, or something <laughs> yeah, like that. Her grandfather died, you know, her grandfather died, and, you know, and that, oh, that's why I can't see you. And I'm like, and then I'm like, okay, you know, and then so she, you know, leaves, and then she comes back, and we're supposed to hang again, and then she ghosts me again, and, and then I still talk to her after that. <laughs> like, like, this is just, but finally, I had to get to the place where I was like, listen, until you're ready to be seen, I can't stop done, done, you know, unfollowed or deleted, blocked, did the whole thing. But the reason why I ultimately had to do that was not even have anything to do with her, but for me. It's like, Devon, who are you? Why are you enduring this? Why are you putting up with this? What is the reward that this is bringing you? And I had to realize like, oh, got it. There's some things in my belief system that I need to look at. I don't feel worthy at that time. You know, I don't feel fully, you know, confident. So I'm, I'm, I'm settling for a situation that is crazy with someone that I actually don't know that I think I do because the fantasy. I'm like, oh, I found someone and the connection's great and the conversation's great and this could be, oh, this could be the one. This could... See how it, it's all interconnected and it all went back to the value system. So as I came out of that, and again, this is good. Okay, the situation is good for me. What did it teach me? Oh, I was too hungry. I wanted it too badly. I didn't ask enough questions. I didn't have enough, you know, self-esteem and self-confidence at that moment to say, hey, if you don't want to be seen, we're done, right? Hey, and that's your choice. It's your life. You don't have to be seen if you don't want to be seen. Fine with me, but I'm not going to be a part of it. Those were the things that then I could take away and then apply, you know, as I move forward. And I have applied those things and it's definitely enriched my life. That's amazing. Has it um, uh, reduced how keen you show that person that you're dating? Because going back to something we were talking about before, I think um, these sorts of things can chip away at you. And so as they start to chip away at you, it starts to then go, well, maybe I shouldn't be so keen or show how keen I am because the last time I did, I lost myself and I abandoned myself. Have you um, changed at all in that area or you're um, trying to stay strong in, no, show you the real you, Yeah. just try not to abandon yourself on that journey? Sure, sure. I am not going to allow anyone to get me out of being who I am. Like, I'm not going, when I talk about abandon myself or, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, what, for me, that's like, no, I am a, you know, I'm a giving person. I'm a loving person. I'm a, you know, open person. And I'm not going to allow anyone or anything I've been through to get me out of, uh, to abandon me, which is those things, that's who I am, right? So I'm not gonna get me out of being me, I'm gonna continue to be me. Now, I will apply wisdom, which means not everyone up top is worthy of the full me, right? So I'm still gonna be loving, I'm still gonna be open, but I'm gonna pace myself. Think about it, if you're, you know, if you're doing a mile run and you start sprinting out of the gate, it's go, you might be cool for a lap, <laughs> but on that second, third lap, you're going to be gasping for air. Why? Because you didn't pace yourself. So it's not about, you know, not being who I am, but giving it time. So now I say, okay, you know, great. This is great. I'm having a good time. Let me give it time. You know, I, when we talk, I'm going to be who I am, but that doesn't mean we're going to talk every day. That doesn't mean every night before you go to bed, I'm gonna text you or you text in the morning when we're talking about the early stages, you know, before things have developed. So part of it was not getting out of being me, not abandoning me, but pacing myself, using wisdom, maybe laying a foundation earlier where I can better evaluate instead of moving so quickly, so fast, that then once I'm in, I look up and say, wait a minute, how did I get in this thing? And, and this person is not aligned with my core values. And this person doesn't want to be seen. You know, like it comes back to like saying, hey, you know what? I'm still going to be me, but I'm going to use wisdom. Because also here's the other part. When you're building a foundation, you know, we're in this beautiful studio, with great foundation. You know, I was at, a, I went and uh, made a movie um, uh, in China, actually. And there was, uh, I will never forget, there was a building that they put up, like a huge skyscraper. Uh, it was in Beijing, right outside of Beijing. And I, I can't remember the exact amount of time, but it was like, it may have been like a month, something just like the fastest you ever heard. But, and so the reason why 
that story was told is because when we were there, the building was condemned and it was tilting over. And they spent all this money, they did it fast, but the foundation wasn't right. And I was like, wow, that's profound. And so when, you, when it comes to dating, it comes to relationship, it's like, no, I'm not gonna let my heartbreak or heartache get me out of being who I wanna be and who I am, but I will use wisdom next time around. You know, I will take what I'm learning to, you know, maybe pace the situation more, not rush, take a little more time, evaluate, and also get a chance to see if somebody really is, is worthy of me showing the fullness of who I am. Because so often we're just giving that fullness to people that they're not even, it's like we're wasting our time and energy and they're not even worthy of it. You know, like let someone earn getting to know you. Let them earn that the same way you're earning to get to know them. Yeah, like, you know what? You're a person I want to get to know, and I'm going to commit to that, to see who you are. And as I get a chance to evaluate, great, this is wonderful. Or you know what? I love who you are. You're just not for me. And that's okay, too. I heard you say um, something like, uh, whatever bait uh, <laughs> equals the, the mate. Yeah, the bait determines the mate. Yeah, 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 yeah. So have you noticed that even, like, your bait um, really is like, no, I'm worthy. And so I'm looking for someone that also feels worthy so that you're attracting them. And if you don't mind actually explaining that phrase as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea, I was talking about social media and I was just saying that, uh, you know, the bait that we put out on, you know, social media specifically, mm -hmm. the bait determines the mate. So a lot of times whatever bait we're putting in terms of the posts that we're making will determine who's DMing us, who's reaching out, the type of person that reaches out. So I was saying, if you want a different mate, maybe you have to use different bait. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, maybe you gotta post different things that really may represent more of who you are versus, hey, I'm gonna post this because it's clickbait, but then it's clickbait, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that for me was, was, you know, learning to navigate, you know, all of that, which was, you know, not, not easy, you know what I mean? And so for me, you know, the bait that I put out there you know, is the bait of, of what I aspire to be, inspire to be, which is, you know, worthiness and love and, you know, charisma and happiness and joy. However, here's what's very interesting about the bait, so to speak. We don't even realize the subconscious bait that we are putting out there. So as certain mates come in, based upon who they are and what they are, that gives us a good evaluator of like, oh, wait a minute. I say I am this, but I have attracted this. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm not really this. Because in my experience, you are what you attract and you attract what you are. So when it comes to the bait, I've learned like, oh, wait a minute. You know, there are some mates coming in where there's some disconnects. Maybe there's a disconnect in me. Maybe I'm actually putting out something that I wasn't even aware of. Okay, so as that happens, I say, wait a minute, I gotta do more work on me. What are the subconscious beliefs that are working against me? What are the things in my spirit that still have to be uprooted that are still attracting you know, a certain type of mate that may not be the best fit for me? That is the work that I have to do. So the bait is not always a conscious bait. It also can be a subconscious bait. I've never thought about it being a subconscious bait. Um... Because again, I think in those moments where if you're attracting somebody, it's easier to say, well, it's them. Oh my goodness, it's the easiest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. But that's when we have to resist the temptation to do that. This is where I go back to being one of one. Okay, I'm one of one. So I have to make the best decisions for myself. I have to make the decisions that are gonna set me up for the life that I want. And part of that decision-making process is resisting the temptation to point the finger. So often, it's so easy to say, well, that person's the problem. Are they? Or is it, there are certain things in you that if they were with someone different, the problem you say that they have, that other person would say, that's not a problem for me at all. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's like, oh, well, it's okay to say, you know what? That actually doesn't work for me because that doesn't create the harmony or the consistency that I want. So it's really more about me versus like, you're the problem. And if you don't change it, it's like, okay, hey, listen, you don't have to change, but here are the things that I know I can adjust and here's the things I can't. Mm -hmm. So what I'm always gonna do is when something comes up, before I point the finger, I'm gonna look at me. What's my role in this? What's my part in this? What do I need to learn? What can I take from this? Why is this happening? 
What's it revealing about me? There's a lot of things I believe to look at before going to someone and say, you are the problem. I think it's more powerful as well. To your point, like for me, if I point the finger at somebody else, I can't do anything about it. But it <laughs> right. Like now it makes me go back to what I was saying earlier about, but it makes me feel powerless. Totally. But the second I can go, oh, like I love using this language and I totally get that other people don't. But I was like, oh, Lisa, it's all your fault. Now, look, I'm not saying <laughs> I want to caveat if it's cheating, infidelity, like I want to put that aside. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but at least for me, like if there's a health problem, oh, Lisa, it's all your fault. If there's a, something wrong, and even my relationship with my husband, where let's say we can't see eye to eye, I'm like, well, I can't force him to see it my way. Right. So how can I take ownership? How am I thinking about this? And then how? what are the things that maybe I need to pivot or look at? Because if I just think that I'm perfect, then again, it doesn't solve That's right. any issues. Um, so I find it more powerful to look inwards and say, what is my part in this? Yes. Um, because then I can act in accordance and I can pivot, but you can't yeah. force other people to pivot. Yes. Or you don't pivot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say, yeah. you know, I've thought about this. And no, how I feel is how I feel. Mm. And that may mean, you know, we don't have a resolution in this moment and that's okay. I can sit in that because I've really thought about it and I've looked at me and I'm clear that this, how I'm looking at this is not something that I actually can change or want to change. So it's all right, I'm gonna sit in that. Or I look at it and say, you know, I can't pivot my thinking on this. That's cool. You know, but I think so often when it comes to the changes we make, sometimes we feel a temptation to want to change ourselves just for harmony in the relationship mm -hmm. or change our perspective just to get through a conversation. And that may actually still be a version of betraying and abandoning ourselves. Because when we stand, you know, in the strength and the truth of who we are, and we do that evaluation and say, yeah, I could change, but I don't want to change that part. I don't know. I, I feel comfortable how I'm looking at this. So, mm -hmm. you know, we may just have to sit in the idea that there's a difference of an opinion and see how time works it out. Yeah. I have an agreement with my husband. So I've been married for 21 years. Yeah. And we have that agreement that you never apologize if you don't actually mean it. And we've pinky swore with each other <laughs> that we don't do yeah. it. So there are times where we'll be arguing and it's like, It'd be so much easier if I just said that I was sorry, we would move on and we would have a you know happy vacation or anything. Yeah. But it's like, no, these are the moments where A, I've never thought about it actually as abandoning myself, but it, now that we're talking, it's really hit me. A, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm sorry because if that isn't true, I need to live in integrity. Yes. Um, and then B, the, the problem won't be solved if I say I'm sorry and I'm not actually sorry. And now if the problem is not solved, how does it then um, rear its ugly head in another way down the road? Absolutely, because it will. And I think this is the thing that, you know, I've been learning and, and it's definitely been a journey, which is um, truth. You know, what is the truth of this situation? What is the truth of the dynamic? What is the truth? Again, versus like, you know, playing in the reality, or, I mean, playing in the fantasy of it. Like, well, what's the truth here? What's true for you? What's true for me? Okay, let's talk through that. Not the truth you want it to be. Not the truth you want me to see, but the truth. Because there, and sometimes there's a lot of fear around that. Well, if I'm truthful, I'm gonna lose. Well, if you're truthful or if I'm truthful and I lose someone or something, did that someone or something belong? Because how can I operate in my truth and be at a loss? No, I'm actually at a gain. Because if someone or something leaves because of my truth, I've actually gained not lost, but it goes back to that accurate thinking. We gotta have a different mindset about it. Yeah, God, that's hit me really hard. Um, and then even with the truth, to your point, there's gonna be two different people's truths. That's right. And being in film, the one thing I actually love is like, if this was a script, how would I write it? <laughs> yeah. Because there's a very big difference to, between what was said and how yes. you interpreted what was said. Absolutely, w absolutely. And and this is one of the, the tips and tools that I would highly recommend for any couple. Uh, you know, whether just dating in a relationship or married, um, you're in a conversation and pause and say, here's what I heard you say, mm -hmm. right? Or, or you can even ask your partner the question, okay, I've said, I've said something, tell me what you heard. And then you hear what they say and then you get a chance to say, well, no, that's not what I was saying, I was saying this. Because it's all about accurate thinking. The more inaccurate our thinking, the more inaccurate our life. And so when it comes to dealing with two people, because we have fears and insecurities, those things distort what somebody's saying. 
we immediately start to say, well, what does this mean about me? And that person may not even be talking about us. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to say, okay, I want to hear your truth. I'm going to create space for your truth. And let's also have a feedback system so that I can repeat back to you your truth and you can say, yes, you heard it correctly or no, you heard it incorrectly and let me make an adjustment. Yeah, God, there's so much nuance in the way someone says something oh my goodness. that they will interpret it the way that their background, their history, their entire life has taught them <laughs> to hear that message. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And that, and that sometimes can be so far away mm -hmm. from, you know, what is uh, being said. I mean, literally, I went through this in, in a dating situation and, you know, I said something and she had a response and I said, well, okay, let's pause. Tell me what you heard me say. Because it was a negative response? It, it just was, it was not, a, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was negative or positive. The response just wasn't in line with what I said. Oh, okay, right. So it was revealing to me that maybe she heard something different. Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, tell me what you heard me say. And she repeated it. And I said, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I said, this is what I'm saying. And this is what I mean. And what I'm saying and what I mean has nothing to do with you, has everything to do with me. And she was like, oh, okay, got it, okay. Because what I said initially was a trigger for her. Mm -hmm. You know, she was triggered for all the things you just said, like, you know, all the experiences that she had and how she's lived life and certain experiences she had. I said some things that triggered what previous situations were. Oh, well, when a guy says this, this means this about me. And I was like, well, no, 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 no. that's not what I'm saying. Let me repeat it. Let me articulate it differently because I really want you to hear my heart and what my intent is because my intent is more about revealing what's going on with me, not an indictment that you're not enough. You're more than enough. I can say that and that's a fact. Now what I'm revealing has to do with where I am and what I'm thinking. And it was really good to have that exchange to be able to clean some of that up. And it really helped you know, us navigate that moment. I love that because it did multiple things. Number one, it gained clarity in the moment. Number two, it, especially when you're dating, it allows them to kind of see how you want to interact. Yeah. Um, and then three, I think it was a beautiful way for you to say, hang on, you haven't quite heard me, but I respect you. Yes. Um, I think that's a beautiful way Absolutely. of approaching it. Absolutely. I mean, create space. We mm. got to create space for each other. You know, no one's going to say things every time perfectly. And, you know, no one's going to hear things, you know, every time accurately. So, you know, we, we create space to have the mutual respect, to be able to have enough bandwidth and enough, you know, elasticity in our dynamic to allow for corrections and, you know, clearing up misunderstandings and all of that. I love that. Have you heard of still manning? Still manning? No. Yeah. So um, I don't know who coined it, but me and my husband, we still man each other. And what it means is you have to pretend you are the other person. And now you have to take my point of view and articulate the point of view as if you're me. Oh, that's cool. I love so that. So instead of repeating what someone's saying, saying like as if I was the bond, like, I believe that I am worthy, so I have to say it like I am you. <laughs> and you have to say it with conviction. I love you can't it. you have to actually say it as if yeah. you were the other person. Yeah. And it has really changed the way we understand each other because the nuance in words, in meanings of words, are very different. And so you repeat something based on what you believe is your meaning of these words. Yeah. But when you but when you're still manning, you have to pretend it is your position. And with the communication piece, there's kind of like these um, two different sides to it. So there's a communication of what you're saying, and then there's a communication of what you actually mean. So kind yeah. of what we're saying here. The problem is that I found a lot of women in relationships, the man will say one thing. I'm just going to say men because most of my audience sure, is females. Yeah, yeah, cool. um, the man will say one thing, but then he'll go and do something completely different. <laughs> okay. So the biggest thing that I hear from my audience is they'll say that they love you, that you mean everything to them, and then they'll go and have an affair. Yes. How do you, as a guy, think about the disconnect between what someone says and what they do? Mm -hmm. And then as thinking through that women are listening right now, how can we not make it about us? Because I think a lot of women, especially when it comes to just infidelity, they think they go back to I'm no good or I'm a bad person or, um, you know, uh, what even in what we're talking about, like what can I do better? I think that if they even have that mindset of what can I do better, especially if their partner has cheated on them, it makes them feel like they are the cause of that infidelity.
What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. Okay, first and foremost, no one can control anyone else. Someone's actions are revealing of who they are not because you did something that made them do something. If ever someone says, oh, I cheated because you weren't giving me this or that, that's an excuse. No, you cheated because you're a cheater. And that's not a judgment. That's an acknowledgement of fact. So, okay, you cheated because that's what you wanted to do. If there was a problem, we could pause, we could communicate, we could try to sort it out versus like taking matters in your own hands and doing that. So first and foremost, it's really important to know that even in something like cheating, that if you're the person that was cheating on, it wasn't, you weren't cheated on because there was something wrong with you, because you don't, you know, you're not doing enough, you're not becoming enough. You were cheated on because that person's a cheater. First thing. Second thing is, and you're talking about from a male point of view, so why do we cheat? A lot of times, as men, men will cheat nothing, which has nothing to do with love. So a, a man can really say, like, I love you. And that same man who sincerely may love the person he's with may still cheat on that person. Now, I'm not saying that as a justification. I'm not saying that is right. That's why I wrote the book Truth About Men, so that we as men can, can stop and think before we act. Because it doesn't matter how much a man loves a woman, there still is that lust. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how it, tra it, it And I think sometimes, you know, going back to what you said earlier, like we're raised on all these fantasies that like, oh, you know, Prince Charming and, you know, Beauty and the Beast and all of that and Elsa and all this kind of stuff, you know, and that, those are fantasies. Meaning just because someone has an attraction for someone else doesn't mean that they don't love you. The issue to me is not the attraction, it's the action. That's the issue. I don't believe that the requirement for a healthy marriage is you're never gonna be attracted to anyone else. That's just not realistic. For a healthy marriage, I would say, be attracted to who you want. But if you are tempted to act on it, we need to talk about it, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And so, so often as men, and again, I am not making excuses for cheating. I'm just trying oh, to yeah. articulate the thought process. So as men, we are taught, you know, shut up, don't cry, suck it up, be a man. So we're taught, don't express ourselves. Expressing ourselves most of the time as a man growing up is met with some act of violence or ridicule. So as a result, we hold it in. And, you know, we're taught, you know, if you're a man, you got to, you know, conquer the world. You got to have this sort of job. You got to have this sort of money. You got to marry this sort of person. You got to have this many kids. So men, you know, buy into that. But what happens is buying into that, those things don't make you happy. And no matter whether or not men communicate well or not, every man still has the need to communicate and to express themselves as every woman does. And so if you as a man have all these thoughts and feelings that you don't have space or room to express, you're gonna go look for an outlet to release. And that doesn't justify cheating at all. I don't think there's any justification for it. But if you're looking for, you know, an analysis or an understanding as I understand it as a man, sometimes that comes from a release. Like over here, I have to be Superman. Over here, I can just be a man. You know, over here, I feel like I've, I don't have the, the space in the room to articulate because I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't created that space. Not because my relationship hasn't given it to me, I as a man haven't taken it. So then I do the easy thing. The easy thing is, well, let me go over here and, you know, have somebody on the side. Or let me go over here and, you know, tell this person all of what's going on and, you know, in the relationship and not doing that. That's the easy way. The hard way for us as men is to first identify, what kind of man do I want to be? Do I want to be a cheater or do I want to be a champion? Champions don't cheat. And cheaters will never be champions. I got to decide what kind of man I want to be. So if I say, hey, I want, I'm a man that wants to be a champion. Okay, great. What do champions do? Communicate. What do champions do? They take it for the team. They do what's in the best interest of the team. 
So if you are in a relationship, one, and you're starting to feel these feelings and you're starting to, you got to pause and say, babe, we got to talk. We got to talk. We got to talk. Because in this dynamic, I need more space to just express myself. I need more space. Whatever your issue is, communicate first. And the second thing is like, okay, let me not put myself in situations that are going to work against the team. Right. So there there you may come across someone, you you know, you may be in a relationship. You may come across someone that you're attracted to or whatever. You say, OK, that's cool. I can appreciate. Yeah, that person is very attractive, but I'm, I'm committed. So as the champion that I am, I'm not going to go start playing for another team. <laughs> I'm not going to do that because I'm a champion and the champion wins for the team I'm on. Now, if I'm no longer on this team, cool, maybe we can talk about it. But until then, like I can acknowledge, oh, yeah, you're attractive, but I'm not going to put myself in a situation that would tempt me to act on that attraction because I've made a decision about my identity. I'm not a cheater, I'm a champion. That's so strong. Oh my God, there's so much there. So um, I'm so on board with it being that I, just because you're with somebody doesn't mean that you don't find other people attractive. And that was so freeing to me Yeah. because I was like, Oh God, I don't have to pretend that I don't find Brad Pitt attractive. <laughs> like, thank God, you know, right, like, right, of course. You know, um, <laughs> but my 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 ex boyfriend before I got married was very jealous, and mm. so literally mentioning Brad Pitt's abs as we're watching Fight Club, he lost his shit, and it was like one of our biggest arguments that we had. And That's why after, he's your ex. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank God I was young enough to have learned that lesson. Yeah. And then I met my husband, and like on the first date, he's like, "Of course you can find other guys attractive." He's like, "You're you're human. You're a woman, and there's you know 7.5 billion people or whatever in That's the world." Right. So to think that this happens to be the one, yeah, is actually a disservice yeah. to the relationship because I think it's more powerful saying the one doesn't exist, but you're the one I'm choosing to be exactly with That's right. forever. And that is actually more romantic that yes. you can find all these other people attractive and yet you choose to be with me and I choose to be with you. That's right. That's right. It's not about the attraction. It's about the action. Yeah. Um, and then the communication part. I am trying to really understand what it's like for guys. Like even though my show is Women of Impact, I think it's super important to really understand the the opposite sex and how they think and how they um, act and so that question thank you for being so transparent and honest like I yeah. really just want the truth and so even when I think about that and the dynamics between men and women um, I've heard I've done just done a lot of interviews with psychologists on relationships and the number one thing that women look for in a relationship is to be seen mm. to actually be yep. seen and I've heard you talk about the importance of seeing if your partner takes notice of you. Uh, yeah. And I thought that that yeah. was so beautiful yeah. to, as a um, way to really see, am I seen? Because there are moments where maybe you feel down on yourself or you feel insecure and you don't realize that you are being seen. Yeah. And so talk to me about how sure. we start to identify um, whether we're being noticed or not. Yeah. So, okay. So a couple of things, one that came to mind, I'll come back to the question, but what came to mind when you were talking about truth, you know, in my experience, you know, and again, I, I usually never like make generalizations about men and women, but I'll do this just to kind of articulate this point. In my experience, you know, uh, one of the Tom Cruise's and Jack Nicholson's like famous movies is called A Few Good Men. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous line, you know, where Jack Nicholson, you know, says, you can't handle the truth. And so in my experience, a lot of times as men, we are hesitant to share our truth with the women that we're with because when we've done it before, we weren't met with open arms. We were met with ridicule. We were met with anger. We were met with, you know, frustration. So it's like, oh, wait a minute. I can't be truthful with you because it's going to set you off. And so the greatest to me relationship is a relationship that has enough space for everybody's truth. Not the truth we want, but the truth that is. Very different. And allowing there to be enough space in the relationship to hear some truth that you may not like. But you know what? I'd rather hear it here. And I'd rather know it here than for us to say, you know what? No, there's not enough room to be truthful. And so everybody starts doing other things. So that's one of the things that I definitely feel uh, is important, you know, to create room for truth and really allow, you know, uh, and again, speaking more general, allowing a man the room to be truthful and for that man to allow the woman to be truthful. Now, when you're talking about, you know, being seen, uh, it comes down to just in terms of me as a man, Again, not only identifying who I want to be, but also identifying how I operate. And here's what I mean by that. I believe, here's how you can tell the difference between a man who is healthy and a man that's toxic. 
The man that's healthy is looking to be of service. The man that's toxic is looking to be served. So if I am a man that's only looking to be served, I'm not going to see you because I'm only going to see you through the lens of how you service me. If I'm looking to serve and be of service, then I'm going to see you. What's your need? What's your thoughts? What are your dreams? What are your hopes? What do you want to do? How do you want to do it? Well, why do you think that? Why do you feel that? Oh, wow, you put some lashes on today. Oh, okay. You got some extensions in. Like, because I'm looking to be of service. So I'm actually evaluating what's in front of me and identifying how I can make a benefit or make a contribution versus looking at it from like, what, what's, it, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of her? What am I going to get out of this? You know, so being seen is essential. And I think it's something that, you know, if I could add anything to the modern dating landscape, it would be this, sight. See people as they are, not as, not as how you'd like them to be. And take the time to notice them. Because so often in dating, dating a lot of times the way we're, you know, kind of socialized into it is so much about, well, what can we get from this person? Versus, I just want to get to know who this person is. I want to see this person. I want to experience this person. That's a very different dynamic than what can I get? You know, so sight and being able to see and being able to just be and say, hey, you know what? Not for me, but man, this has really been great to get to know you. It, there's, I think sight is the thing that could change everything because so often most people in my experience are not seeing. They're projecting. I love the way you broke that down. Um, how do you feel about uh, feeling appreciated? And the mm -hmm. reason why I ask that is that in a lot of studies out there and just interviews that I've done with psychologists, men really want to be appreciated. They want to yeah. be seen, but they <laughs> actually want to be appreciated. Yeah. And I heard a story a long time ago about Jim Carrey and he divorced and he ended up telling a story about that was so profound. It really hit me. And me and my husband use this all the time. He goes out and he feels like he's conquering the world, right? Like he's got like a traditional mindset that his wife's at home and he's providing for the family. And he goes out and he's conquering the world by doing these movies, putting so much time and energy into being the best and showing up every day. And then he comes home and his wife says, can you take out the trash? Mm. And he said, that was the moment that he felt like he wasn't appreciated. Yeah. And that was the moment that he then felt his relationship had broken. Absolutely. And that was really profound for me because I think for me, I'm always, you know, like anybody in my own head. And I think a lot of women do want to be seen, but then the other side of men actually want to be seen, but also appreciated for them, traditional or not, going out and conquering yeah. the world. And my husband says the same thing. He's like, babe, I feel like every day in business, I'm slaying the dragons for you. <laughs> and he's like, and I'm a warrior. <laughs> and I am coming home with blood on my face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, and I feel proud that I've done that. Like, I, I feel good about being able to show up for sure. you and the family and provide and put a roof over your head. And he's like, and I want you to appreciate the fact that I'm going out and slaying dragons every day. Yeah. Now, for me as a female who is in business with him, I'm like, but I'm slaying dragons too, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and yeah. so it's really been this interesting dynamic discussion that we've been talking about yeah. and then really kind of piecing apart the importance of a guy feeling appreciated. And I didn't judge him or put him down for it, right? He was very honest about what he was looking for. And so that then triggered the, how do you feel appreciated? Like, what's that mm -hmm. thing that I need to do where you feel appreciated? Because I feel like I'm showing appreciation. Yeah. So I'd love to know your thoughts on that. You know, as men, I would say we probably want to be respected more than we want to be loved. And I look at appreciation as a subset of respect. So when you give that Jim Carrey, you know, analogy for him, what he was experiencing is like, I'm not being respected. What I'm doing to provide for our lifestyle and all the things that are that go into that, that I have to do for this all to happen, you know, and then I come home and it's like, take out the trash. It's like, oh. I'm not being respected in this. I'm not being appreciated. My contribution is not being respected because in that dynamic, I'm assuming he was feeling like, well, take out the trash. Oh, so you're trying to like tell, like, I don't care who you are out there. Here, this is what you're gonna do. And that as a man is difficult because we do wanna be appreciated. We do want to be respected. We do wanna know that, you know, not only just what we do, but who we are, that, that, that there's appreciation there. So I'll use it as an example. A lot of times what, 
and again, this is general. I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing in a way I don't normally sure, to answer yeah. your question yes, about the women that you. are listening. Because I, I just, you know, I give close qualifications. I don't like to generalize. So in my experience, you know, what will attract a woman to a man is just who he is. His essence, his aura, his determination, his, you know, confidence, you know, what he's doing in the world and how he's doing it. Those things are very attractive. So then what happens sometimes is that what attracts a woman to a man is then the thing that the woman wants the man to stop doing so much. <laughs> which is which which then makes the man feel underappreciated. It's like, well, wait a minute. What got you here in part was me being so committed to my career and me being so committed to my purpose and my calling. And then now, all of a sudden, that's a li- my calling is a liability for our love. How does that work? So part of the appreciation is to say, I love what my man is doing. This is awesome. And if it's like, hey, I love what he's doing and I'd like some more time, you can still articulate the need for time without feeling like what the man is committed to is causing a problem. Because the commitment to his calling is what got most you know, women to want him in the first place. Because he's ambitious. He's got a vision for his life. He's out there doing it. Ooh, that's attractive. And now that I'm with him, well, don't do that so much. No, 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 no. You're out there too much. What? How? No. No. If you like who that man is when you marry him, support him on the other side of it. You know, I know for me in times when I've felt appreciated, it comes from being seen. I see what you're doing. Wow. That's amazing. How, how are you doing all this? You know, when in terms of what women who I felt appreciated from would say, you know, the interest, the curiosity, paying attention, you know, wanting to know the details, all those things make me feel appreciated. Like, oh, you're actually involved in my story, right? Like you're really in the details of my story. Wow, I feel so appreciated. Because a lot of times you'll deal with people and they're talking about them or they don't remember what you said because they weren't paying attention, it didn't didn't matter to them. So for me, I feel appreciated when someone's in the details. Oh, wow, right. Oh, you said this last time, Devon. Now you're saying this, tell me about that. How was that experience for you? I say, wow. So as men, we want to feel appreciated. We want the women in our lives to be in the details of what we do and ask us questions. Well, how do you do that? There's nothing better as a man than to be asked those questions. Well, how do you do that? Well, why did you do that? Tell me more. Oh, well, let me tell you what I did, baby. Let me, you know, yeah, let me, that's why I did. And this is how I think. Like, it's like, oh, wow. She's interested, not in just what I do, but who I am. She's interested in how I think. She's interested in how I process information. I feel appreciated greatly. And in the situations that I've been in where I didn't feel appreciated, I didn't feel that those people were in the details of my life. You know, it was more about what I could do for them and how I could service them. Not so much like, hey, you know, Devon, you are a man that's of service and I see that and and I'm gonna respond by being a woman of service. You know, I see that. And I appreciate that and I love that about you. And I'm gonna be a partner in that. So that it's not just a one way, you know, street. Did you articulate it to them in those moments that you didn't feel appreciated? Um, you know, I do not think I have ever articulated it that way. I felt it, but I don't think I've ever used it. You know, I think at those times when I felt unappreciated, I think I've just, you know, had the conversation of like, hey, well, you know, I don't feel like you're that into me. Mm. <laughs> it's more that's that. very different though it's very different <laughs> it's very different you know um now from this conversation i might say oh, i might just use that language you know i don't feel that appreciated in this moment or you know and then that then, well why don't you feel appreciated well here's why i don't feel appreciated but yeah i think i've used it more of like well i don't think you're that into me you know i don't think that you know there was a situation that I, a dating situation that i ended because i was just like no you know, you are not appreciating, you know, who I am and the sacrifices that I have to make to do the things that I was doing for this particular individual that I was dating. And I just felt like the response to it was, you know, I was like, oh, so this, this is, you're just used to all, okay. All right. If you're just used to this and this is just, you know, you're not, you don't appreciate all that that goes into me doing this for you. That's cool. I'm just not going to do it for you. (laughs) I'm not going to stop doing what I do, but I'm going to find the right person who appreciates it. Uh, I'm going to push you a little on this because 
she may have thought, and I don't know, obviously, but she may have thought she was showing appreciation. And so there's a big difference between what you think you're doing and then how the person's perceiving it, right? Absolutely. And it's like the love language. Whereas like for the longest time, my husband, like he was just busy. And I'm like, I feel like you're always busy. And he's like, babe, but I'm always telling you I love you. And I think of it. And I was like, but that's, that's not my love language. <laughs> he's like, what's your love language? I was like, time. So, or just like really thinking that he's thought of me. So for like, Three years after, he's like, well, how? tell me exactly what I need to do. So for me and him, it was very much like, if you boiled the kettle for me every morning when I wake up, the kettle's already boiled. And now I feel like, oh, you've thought about me mm. before you've even seen me. That makes me feel really good. So I don't have to see you um, all day. Like me and my husband basically don't see each other unless we're kind of working Monday to Friday. And that's just a relationship that we've agreed on and we love. But in those moments where he's just boiled a kettle, now I feel like I've been seen that, like, oh, he knows how much I want a cup of tea. <laughs> right, right. And then the other way around, it's like, okay, I'm, I want you to think about my dinner, for instance. And I'm like, okay, do I have to cook your dinner? <laughs> or can I order Postmates to right, be delivered? Right, right, right. And so even getting that, like, detailed, he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I just... If you've just thought about me and you've all the Postmates, it makes me feel appreciated of how hard I'm working because, you know, I don't have time to eat. Mm. And so really kind of even stripping apart the way that we perceive it. So even with you, with this other woman, I'll say, I don't know the situation. Yeah. But if you hadn't articulated it to her, she sure. may not have known and she may have thought already that she's shown the appreciation, but it didn't land with you. This is true. And this is going back to the evaluating. Mm -hmm. It's like, hmm, okay, yeah, Devon, you know, you may have wanted to just articulate that, you know, you weren't feeling appreciated and here's why, instead of drawing a conclusion about her intent that you didn't even ask her about. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There is no doubt about it. Now, I feel like my intuition, you know, about the situation was correct. However, you know, there was, I should have had in a direct conversation. You know, and I did, I did have a part of it, but it wasn't as clear as we're talking about it now. So, you know, me getting to a better place within myself, or not even so much a better place, but even a stronger place to be able to articulate, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not really feeling like you appreciated that. And that's not for me trying to manipulate. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I was really excited to do this for you. And your response kind of took the excitement away. Like, it just wasn't that big of a deal for you. So. You know, why is that? You know, like ask the question yeah. instead of just assuming, oh, you're, you're ungrateful. That, that's totally part of the growth. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I think a lot of us, I've heard you even speak about this, about the unspoken expectations that oh, we yeah. have when we go into relationships. Yes. I mean, that's unspo unspoken expectations are relationship killers. Because, you know, we have these expectations of how someone is supposed to respond, how they're supposed to communicate, what they're supposed to do. We never articulate what those expectations are. We never get agreement from them to meet those expectations. But then we treat them as if we have. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking someone's supposed to read our minds and then we get mad at them and we draw a conclusion about their intent when we have never expressed it. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, what, something's not right here. We're the ones that are crazy. To expect something of someone that they are not even aware of and then get mad at them as if they are aware. So the idea is like any unspoken expectation is going to kill your relationship. So the key, you don't have to give up the expectation, but you got to communicate it. Mm. Here's what I expect. Can you meet it? You know, I expect the kettle to be on in the morning. Can you do that? And then your partner can say, well, yeah, I can do that. Cool. All right, great. So then you can hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. You told me I can expect the kettle to be on and it's Wednesday and it's not on. I can be accountable because we had the conversation and I know what the expectation is. But if you get mad at me, you know, if you're, you get mad at your partner, the kettle's not on. It's Wednesday. It's not on. Well, babe, we never had the conversation. Well, you don't love me. What, what do you mean I don't love you? Well, I didn't know that, that the way you would like love is to be expressed is through the kettle. If I knew that was the expectation, I could tell you I can meet that or I can't. It's about accurate thinking. It's about accurate communication instead of just assuming and this is where our beliefs around love can then be a liability because we assume, oh, if you love me, then you'll know. Mm -hmm. Well, when, 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 how does that happen? We find love and all of a sudden we get a sixth sense. That <laughs> <laughs> we're like downloaded everything this person wants without having to ask them. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It's like, no, like I love you and now I need to learn you. I need to learn more about you. Part of learning is like, hey, here's what, what are you expecting? Here's what I'm expecting. I mean, you all, you know, do phenomenal business. The people you're in business with, how, why does the business relationship that you've been in, how do they succeed? Because you're both clear on the expectation. 
we're clear what's expected from this partnership. So as a result, we can deliver. Whenever the expectation is unclear or unspoken, it hurts the partnership. Because then people start getting mad and frustrated and drawing inaccurate and incorrect conclusions when there isn't accurate thinking, communication, and expectation. I love that you said we have to learn each other. Yes. That's so beautiful. I've never thought about it like that. But that's such Absolutely. That goes back to being seen. That goes back to, you know, being appreciated, learning. Like, think about it. You're shin spending time with someone or sharing your life with someone. And every day that person is changing. You know, we're not stagnant. Every day we change in some way. So every day there's something new to learn. You know, I think some of the best relationships are when there's that curiosity and that openness to get to learn our partner. Instead of assuming, well, I've been with you for, you know, 20 years, I know you. Well, you may have known me, but you don't know me now. Because what I thought 20 years ago, I'm different now. Or what I thought 30 years ago, or what I thought 30 days ago mm -hmm. is different. So being open enough to be able to, and curious enough to say, hey, I want to get to learn, I want to learn you. I want to learn more about you. I want to learn how you think. I want to learn how, why you say certain things. Why, what, you know, and, and, and in my experience, because in dating, there is, that's not always the dynamic, you know, I've been told like, oh, wait a minute. Like I've never had to, you know, when I'm dealing with certain uh, women that I've dated, Wow, do you, I just never had to think about these things. Like you ask me questions, no one's ever asked me in my life. And I say, wow, that's cool. You know, I get that it may be a little uncomfortable because you've never had to think about it, but that's cool. Like, I, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that because I want to learn. I want to learn who you are. I want to learn what you do, why you do it. That's essential. How can, how can love grow if learning has stopped? You know, people love the game of golf. You know, I got a lot of friends in golf and they love it. Why? Because every time they get on the course, they're learning. Okay, wait, how am I, what, what club do I need to use to, to hit it this far? And what do I need to do to be more accurate? And there's never a time you're, you're on that court or on that course, excuse me, and you're not learning because you love it and you want to learn as much as you can. So often with love, we think, oh, once I'm married, I got the person, I know all there is, and we stop learning the person. And what happens? Love stops growing. Instead of saying, I, now, when we get married, now I get to learn you for the rest of my life. Mm. The learning really starts now. Great. It's just a different way to think about it. It's a mind shift. It really is. And it allows you to realize that th there's always things you can know about each other. Yep. And that just like learning if you're going to school, well, you need constant classes where they're telling you what to learn in order for you to actually learn itself, like the teaching. <laughs> right. So when you're thinking about each other, you need to articulate so that person can actually receive so that they can learn about you. And so there's the unspoken expectations. You're not teaching that person how to love you, how to show the appreciation, how you're to You're assuming this. that they're going to know. Yeah. But I think it comes back to, if you've been in a relationship for a long time, I think part of it becomes the feeling of not being seen, where it's like, well, if they see me, then they'll know. And I used to be a culprit of this. Like I was like, oh, my husband, he would just know. And so I hinted to him about a, a 10,000 different things, just hinting. Because A, I didn't mm -hmm. feel confident in myself. And because I didn't feel confident in myself, I felt like if I speak up or if I just said something that maybe he didn't realize, I think that I would have felt insecure over it. So I was like, well, if I just hint to him, then I'm not putting myself out there and then eventually he'll get the hint and then mm. he'll show it. But it's like, it did just, I realized after a long time, I was setting him up for complete failure. Absolutely. Because he's, you're, you're giving him a test that he doesn't even know he's taking. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens in relationships. We start testing people. It's like, why, why, do we, why are we testing someone? Why don't we just articulate, hey, here's, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm experiencing. Here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I would like. Here's what I would want you to know. Instead of testing them, well, let me see how much they love me. Let me see what they do. Then we wonder why it doesn't work. Yeah. You know, because you didn't even know, you, someone didn't even know they were being graded. They just were being themselves. But had they known, they would have made an adjustment. And this goes back to what we've been talking about, which is when I know I'm one of one and I know I'm worthy and I'm valuable, then I, I feel good about advocating for myself. I can communicate and say, hey, I don't want you to assume certain things. I'm changing. And I need you to know what those changes are. You know, here's how I'm feeling. Here's what I'm thinking. Versus like, well, if you don't know, then you clearly don't love me. Well, if you don't know, then clearly you're not into me. No, because then that also becomes a, a mechanism to avoid rejection. So it's like, oh, well, I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to be, well, let's pause. 
why don't you want to be rejected? What about rejection is so painful? It's not the rejection. It's our value that we associate with whatever we're being rejected from. So if someone rejects me, that's a reflection of their choice and decision making, not me. But what happens is when I'm rejected, when we're rejected, sometimes our ego takes a hit, right? Like, well, no, I, would, I, don't, I, I can't handle, you know, being rejected because I believe I have an idea of who I am. And, you know, and it's like, well, OK, so if we're so attached to that idea or image, the rejection shakes that. Rejection is not a re revelation of our, someone's lack of self-worth. It's a rejection of whoever made it. It's a projection of whatever that person is. You know, rejection to me is redirection. You know, rejection can be protection, but so often we attach our own value to it. And then as a result, our ego gets involved versus saying, oh, okay, this is happening to me. Rejection is not something I'm praying for, but if it's happening, all right, why am I being rejected? What are the circumstances of that? And having enough self-confidence to be able to not internalize the rejection. Like, yes, I'm going to put myself out there with my partner and I'm going to be vulnerable with them and they may reject me. But the price of vulnerability is worth the possibility of rejection. Because vulnerability leads me to victory, regardless of who can handle it or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to live another day in my life where I, I'm not going to be who I want to be and express how I want to express and live how I want to live for fear that someone's not going to accept it. Them not accepting me is a, uh, a reflection of them, not me. Mm. I love that. But also just to add, if they are rejecting you, I actually personally want to know why and actually see if there's any truth in it. Because again, if that can actually help me get stronger, sure. right? Like I just kind of go to business, right? Or, uh, you know, um, I've been rejected in business a lot, but it's actually motivated me sure. to go, oh, they're right. I, I, I'm not skilled enough for this. And sure. actually now I can get skilled. So even in a relationship, if they reject you for X, Y, and Z, I think it's an opportunity to look to see, instead of taking it internal and say, I am bad. That's right. You can still internalize it and say, is there something here to teach me so that I can actually get sure. better? Absolutely. But even in that job situation, you know, that person that is rejecting the deal, they're rejecting it because of what their needs are. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, ah, it's, it's not ah. that, that you're mm -hmm. not good enough. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're great where you are. It's just, you're just not, you don't, you're not providing what I need. Mm -hmm. Right now, you're right. Now, okay, I can take that in and say, all right, well, maybe the development that I need to do for my business is to get to a place where I can offer more services to be able to meet greater needs. And as a result, I'll be able to generate greater revenue. Cool, but still that person that's rejecting you is rejecting you based upon their needs, not your inadequacy. I love that clarity. <laughs> Thank you. I am now shifting in real time. I love that thinking. I think it's so powerful. Devon, I literally could just keep talking to you. Your Likewise. wisdom, your ideas, your thoughts, your knowledge are so profound. Thank you. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Where can people find you Likewise. and everything that you're doing? Oh, you know, on social media, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on Instagram, at Devon Franklin, same thing on TikTok. Uh, same thing on Twitter, at Devon Franklin Official on Facebook. And then everyone go to my website, DevonFranklin.com. And, you know, I got a lot of knowledge and things there and all the books and all that stuff. Keep watching, guys, to learn the three keys to identifying the right partner for you. So let's talk, actually talk about that friction because sometimes, like you said, the friction can be great. It's exactly what you need to get aligned, be a great couple, really work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that friction where you think, oh my God, I just need to work through the friction, but actually it just becomes worse. And now that friction becomes the break or the crack in your relationship. And now there's... Um, you're trying to repair it, but actually it probably would have been better to let go sooner. Mm -hmm. How do you, I've, in fact, I've heard you speak with Rich about one of the scenarios where I believe he had a relapse. And that was one of the moments in your relationship where it almost broke you guys. In that moment with the friction, how did you know, or what were the signs, maybe you didn't know, but maybe you can share with us some thoughts about how you decided to keep going and try and fix, not fix that, it's not the right word, become in harmony again versus say, okay, this friction now doesn't serve our marriage. It, maybe it's time to break up. Yeah, I mean, it's a big one. In my case, in this one instance, um, I had a, the universe gave me the, uh, the set the table, let's just say that. So I came back from Rich um, DNFing and using, and it was finally my time to record my record. 
because I recorded two albums with my sons were in my band. Mm. And so it was finally my time and I had waited all this time. We didn't have enough money and I'd been supporting Rich and his training and I, I, it was my time. So I had the recording engineer coming to my house and we had set up and we had started recording my record. And I was just like, I can't, I can't deal with this right now. Like I'm not dealing with this mm -hmm. right now. So there was a little time out. And then right after that, during the recording, um, my son's beloved father died uh, tragically. And then it was just irrelevant. Like the DNF was completely mm -hmm. irrelevant at that point. And we just moved on. And, but I would say, you know, barring that kind of drastic universal moment, um, I would say, you know, you just gotta let shit go. I mean, basically, it, you can decide to hold a grudge and live in the past and grind and grind and grind and grind, and it's only gonna create suffering. And so I always ask myself, am I going to be married to this man? Yes, uh, you know, uh, do I have a million other things that we've experienced that have been, you know, loving and expansive and creative and life affirming? Yes, and it's a choice. You know, do I wanna live in that hell and hold on to that or do I wanna be free and just let it go? So it's like being born anew, like in the moment, in a new moment, in a new moment. Um, and you know, what you put your attention on is what you create. So you know, where you put your focus is what you're gonna create more energy on. And you found this in a relationship. Like if you guys get stuck on one thing and you just keep going in and you're like, poking the bleeding wound and picking the scab off, like that's what you were talking about. But if you just shift the focus, it can be a whole, whole new reality, like in a matter of an hour almost. So I think it just comes with maturity and just, you know, sometimes you're gonna be disappointed. That's how it goes. And in every decision you make, there will be positive things about it and negative things about it. Nothing is all good or all bad. Life is gray, it's not black or white. So again, coming back to what I was suggesting, it's how you apply perspective. And so again, in my spiritual mentorship, it's all about taking the empowerment of applying the perspective that you choose. Mm. So when I went through a nine year financial collapse with Rich, during our marriage, which catalyzed everything that we've become, people would say to me, you know, oh, you know, you're, you know, you're a deadbeat, you can't pay your bills, you know, I didn't have a bank account for four years, you know, I had both cars repossessed, I couldn't get my kids to school. Things were intense. Um, and uh, a lot of people wanted to apply their fear onto me. This was a big one, because I was going through this sort of alchemization of the money system. So on a planetary level, I knew that I was clearing some of the violence in, in our systems um, against people, artists, like how many beautiful musicians or artists or teachers or philosophers, you know, are selling insurance mm. because they're trying to pay their bills because, you know, we're in this paradigm, right? Yeah. So I knew by going through this that I was starting to melt some edges of that the, for the collective, right? And so Rich, which made no sense, I was telling him to train first, to see to me and the kids second, and if a law job fell in his lap, he could service it, but without any emotion, mm. because he, that was not in alignment for him. And why did I do this? I knew this because I could feel the energy. It was a shift in the energy. You know, he could have sent out thousands of resumes and he wouldn't have gotten a job. We were in this alchemy experience and this was part of our becoming so that we could be the catalysts and the examples, the living examples for others to choose a life of living according to their heart, their dreams. And so, um, again, it's perspective, people would become very afraid and they would be freaking out. Like, because if this is happening to you, then it could happen to mm -hmm. me. So I want you to get away from me. Or I would have somebody say, you know, if I was you, I wouldn't choose bankruptcy. I just wouldn't choose it. 
And I looked at this individual and I said, really? I said, well, it might just choose you someday. That's a yeah. great answer. <laughs> well, it's, it, it was not a light thing. And, and also in our story, it wasn't like I woke up one day and I was like, we're going to choose our hearts and lose all our money and right. you know, starve for nine years. Like, it, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling. You can feel it. And I call it being dismantled. It's like the energy no longer matches the vibration that you hold. Mm. And so there was nothing to attach to us. And so there were years of self-discovery, of Rich becoming a vegan, plant-based ultraman, of running in the mountains, of me meditating and you know, doing uh, so many ceremonies and rituals and all kinds of things that I've done that I haven't written about, mm. um, and, and creating music with my children over a seven year period that was worth me taking a body for, just to make music with my boys for seven years. Are you kidding me? Like no one even had to hear a note. It was already fulfilled on the deepest level. So people would say to me, you know, you're, you know they would project that fear of, you know, you're, you're a loser, you're a deadbeat, you can't play, pay your bills. You're... And I would say, no, I'm in my sacred moment. And at the time they thought she's an insane person. <laughs> but now, mm. but now, People call, call me all the time or come up to me and they're, they're emotional about it because they know what we did mm. to be standing in this place where we are. And once you live it and you digest it, it's your experience. No one can take it from you. Someone can't say online, you know, oh, screw them, they're fraud. Like, it just doesn't matter yeah. because it's in the being. And truth and beingness, they don't defend, they simply are. And it's, 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 it's part of who I am. It's part of my makeup. Ooh, okay, there's so much there that I didn't want to interrupt you, but girl, we've got to go deep. Okay, there was one thing that you said, first of all, that I was like, that just takes such security in oneself to turn to your partner and say, put me second. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd love to actually talk about that because many people, if they're not put first in their relationship, they feel less than and then they feel insecure in that relationship. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, I'd love to pull apart that piece where you said to him, like, you know, was it his, um, his running first? Was that mm -hmm. training? His training first mm -hmm. and then you and the kids. Mm -hmm. um, break that down for me because it is so beautiful mm -hmm. because that's also the gift that I think we want is that let me be me first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, being uh, somebody that believes or, or feels deeply that we come into this life to become who we are. Mm. And there's only one of you in the entire omniverse. So there's not another Lisa coming. Um, so if I wanted that for myself, I had to want that for Rich. I had to want it for him. It's, it would be hypocritical and misaligned if I only wanted it for me. And so while it seemed on the surface what I should have been telling him is go get another law job. I just knew that the way to evolution and expansion is through the heart. The heart doesn't fail you. It will not fail you ever. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. So I always say like, I didn't know it was going to take that long. It was tough. Mm -hmm. It was really tough. And let me be clear. I want to be seen as much as rich. I'm not behind rich. And it's been a little challenging in, in my life because I felt I was going to be fully realized when I was 30. I just turned 60. And I haven't even begun. I'm, I'm just beginning. And so a lot of the narrative in the culture about you know, rich being you know, rich, 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 which is beautiful and it's amazing, that's a challenge in our marriage now it, because I was never behind rich. I was the entrepreneur. I was pushing him the whole time. And of his own admission, he, you know, he said to me the other day, he said, you are always destined for a great life. And he said, and you, you knew I was destined for a great life, but I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, and Rich is just, he's masterful at what he does. I mean, what a beautiful expression of life and everything that he's created. And his platform has given so many people, like, so much love and nourishment and, and uh, celebration, you know, and being his partner, it's like, I don't go, you know, he's at, he's at a, a Google event right now and I'm not going because I'm not available to be arm candy. I don't do that. 
So okay, this is so amazing. God, let's let's go deep on this because everything you're saying is things that I deal with. I know so many other people deal with in battle, especially now as we we women are now finding it beautiful to be able to step into our own, to build our own businesses, to be independent, to have our own voice, to have our own platforms, um, and so the nuance of stepping into your own but also supporting someone that is just as strong just as vocal has just as strong of a voice but not ma making sure that you don't disappear into the background making sure that you don't step in your you don't um stay in the shadows and it reminded me of one moment it was probably a couple of years ago now before i was actually in front of the camera mm -hmm. one day tom and i were talking and he broke down in tears mm -hmm. and he said babe no one will truly understand that I'm the man I am today because of you. Mm. And everyone gives me the accolades because he's in front of the camera mm. because people know his name. Mm. And he's like, I, I wouldn't exist or be the person I am if it wasn't for you. And you don't get any of that recognition, if you will. And so there was something you said earlier that I really want to make sure that we pinpoint as we start to talk about this is you said it was your turn. So you were stepping into the studio. How many of us women wait for it to be our turn yeah. mm -hmm. how we're like okay let me just have the kids let me just make sure mm -hmm. the husband is good let me just make sure that i've supported him first mm -hmm. and then it will be my turn yeah i mean that's just a gigantic whole universal like it's a planetary condition that, that you're speaking to and it's because we live in a patriarchal a patriarchal realm you would say so it's the masculine that has been celebrated that is put in the forefront and it starts thousands of years ago and even beyond that when the feminine frequency was ripped out of the spiritual history of this planet all right so it's not just me too it's way before then mm -hmm. it's where no priests were were uh, women anymore where we were burned at the stake for healing with plants uh we've been eradicated out of the entire uh uh, our entire divine place, our divine right place in life. So this doesn't have mm. to do with our husbands or our partners. Mm. This is a program that is very, very deep. So it's important that we start to recognize that this is what this moment in time is about. This is a new procession, planetary procession, and a new moment, a new eon, a new age. And so this is about the feminine coming into her rightful position, mm -hmm. not overpowering the masculine, right. but in equal balance, right? So masculine and feminine exist within each of us. And let's be clear that the feminine energy wants to be seen. So relationship tip, if you're in relationship with a woman or a feminine embodied person, they want to be seen. Make sure you are seeing them. Mm -hmm. See them, see them, see them. That is what the feminine wants. So then you get to, you know, you were saying, how do you not be in the background? How do we do it? Because we're nurturing and not only are we nurturing our children, we're nurturing our partners as well. Mm -hmm. So there is a time element. I mean, it, 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 I, I wasn't putting myself in the background because I was doing all of my spiritual practices and my rituals and my ceremonies and I was holding the vision and I was leading the way. I was, I was guiding him through this awakening and I was also working on my music. So not only was I writing music and, and lyrics and music, but that I then was collaborating with my sons who were becoming musicians. Mm. So there is given to, I mean, there is yeah. times where you give to your partner and you, and you serve, but I guess where we're not is in the martyrdom. There is no place for martyrdom, mm. for like to not fulfill yourself because someone else, you know, is in the front position or whatever. So it's a challenge. And I think it's probably the biggest challenge in Rich and my relationship right now, because we're not, you know, I'm not in, we're not collaborating on, on as many things and we're both makers mm -hmm. we both are creating things and so you know that's a that's a little bit of a challenge like how do we intersect yeah that's that is what is so incredible i mean one of a, a million things of what's so incredible about your journey and your story mm -hmm. is um having gone through everything you've just laid out for us and then 
really owning that you are an equal and that this is what I'm doing, this is what I love, now's my time, I'm going to do it, you know, I'm still going to serve my husband and having like this beautiful, I don't even say balance, it's, I like the word harmony, I prefer mm, harmony, right? Like You've that. got a better harmony with how you show up every day. And the thing that I just, I get asked a lot from my audience is the evolution piece, is that, mm. hey, for the first couple of years, I was supportive, you know, that's my story. For eight years, I was supporting my husband. I was a stay-at-home wife, I was cooking for him, I was cleaning for him but I wasn't in my own I wasn't saying what I wanted and that was on me not on him mm -hmm. but I was profoundly unhappy I didn't enjoy providing for him food and that wasn't my love language or it wasn't hit it was his but it wasn't mine so I wasn't finding any satisfaction and instead I was just becoming more and more unhappy and miserable and it was hard for me to get out of that to speak up and say hey I'm not living the life I actually want and so in what you're saying there's this evolution piece of I used to be this or I used to show up like this and now I'm transitioning. And when you're in a relationship with somebody else that is prides themselves also on evolving, like Rich and like my husband Tom, it becomes difficult to navigate to your point of how this is who I want to be, this is what I want to become, this is who um, how I want to evolve. And so you focus on that and at the same time your partner's doing that making sure you're always aligned and not going off on different paths is very difficult. And this is where whenever I backtrack and I go, where was the point where people started to split apart? Mm -hmm. Because when you hear about marriage, when you hear about relationships, they were once connected, you hope, right? They were once totally on the same line. And then people say, I blinked and now they've changed or I've blinked and now we're not connecting. And the truth is you never freaking just blink ever. So what happens in that blinking moment that we're not paying attention to mm -hmm. that then takes our drive and our want to be an independent woman, a badass, an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. these are the words that I like to use, where you've created this Srimu, which is amazing, mm -hmm. which we're definitely going to go into, mm -hmm. but you've poured your heart and soul into this mm -hmm. product and it's succeeding and it's freaking blowing up mm -hmm. and now people are knowing who you are more and more. And Rich is on his path. Mm -hmm. So I know you said this is actually a difficult moment. What are you guys doing if you don't mind sharing some of those things? Because I never want someone to go, I have to choose between my independence, my career, my life, and my relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think that has to be a choice of one or the other if you're in the right relationship. Right. Well, I would say it's important to acknowledge that we are in a planetary procession, a moment of transformation, and everyone, mm -hmm. no matter where you are, you're going through change and evolution. So no one is going to stay in a status quo. Everything is gonna evolve. So there's a couple things that I'm focused on and I've been communicating with Rich about. And one of the big questions is, how do you wanna evolve? Not, not from a focus of how do we um, how do we guard the relationship? Okay, so I'm being more, Ooh. I'm being more um, uh, courageous than that. Ooh, go on. So again, so so similarly, as I supported him through that moment of transformation, and when Rich and I were married, probably similarly to you guys, you know, we vowed to support each other to realize our wildest dreams. That was our vow. So. You know, I had studied with a, an Indian master, one of my many, one of my many boyfriend guru, gurus, <laughs> uh, who uh, proposed to me that human love is like a business arrangement. Human love says that if you do X, Y, and Z, then I will love you. Mm. And if you cease to do X, Y, and Z, I will remove my love from you. And he was comparing that to divine love. And he was saying, divine love is like the sun. It's simply shining without cessation, without edit, without terms, without rules, without a deal, right? And that was one of the big catalysts in Rich and my relationship when he was eating a lot of meat and a lot of junk food and he was struggling. It was this shift that allowed him to become who he is, mm -hmm. was releasing this. So our big questions to ourselves, right now are what are you hiding oh that's such a hard go explain that question actually first well we're all hiding something right i mean because 
because we have a society and we have this patriarchal system and we have systems and schools and jobs and you know whatever you thought you were supposed to be or whatever you thought thought the world was going to be um, or um, aspects of yourself that you haven't sat with or uh, levels of yourself that you haven't embodied you know I always say like if you're judging another person if you see somebody online and they're annoying you and you have all this stuff to say about them it's because you haven't loved yourself enough because mm. it's not a contest <laughs> so if you have to tear another person down or it's, it's really annoying you what you're really annoyed at is that you haven't given yourself that level of presence and really taken the time to know who you are what you love so as we evolve and as we go through different layers of awareness what are you hiding like what is it inside of yourself that you have not even allowed yourself to see mm -hmm. the second question is how do you want to evolve how do you want to evolve i mean you, we've been now in these relationships these marriages for going on 20 years over 20 years and we're going to be here maybe for a while no one ever knows but you know you you guys are like fit and healthy and you have all this stuff going on so it's like how do we want to evolve you know you've already digested this level of relationship and so where is that going because probably like rich and i have one sort of agreement we promised each other we would never go to home depot with each other on the <laughs> It's something super profound and like mind blowing right now. And it's like, don't go to Home Depot. That is off limits for us. <laughs> that is never happening. So, uh, you know, so the, it's this wonderful uh, moment, this precipice, this vista that we're standing on of creating ourselves anew. And in order to do that, we have to be courageous. We have to love each other so much that we have to want the ultimate for ourselves mm. and the ultimate for our partner. And there are certain things that I will never do with Rich. And there are certain things that he will never do with me. And I'm not talking about, you know, don't start thinking like I'm saying open relationship because it's not what I'm saying. And as a matter of fact, I, I want to talk about sacred sexuality within this context because we're also at a platform in our sexual relations mm. that we are being called to rewrite a sacred union that is an experience of activating the divinity that is in within us, meaning creativity, spirituality, and sexuality is a trinity. It's the same force. So what if you knew, what if we knew that our sexual energy was our most sacred force? how would you enter into that and how would that exchange be different so i don't think it's existing yet some of us are starting to rewrite that experience oh my god thinking about sexuality sorry i didn't mean to cut you off but i was just like i was like this is amazing thinking about sexuality on the same path as creativity is fascinating fascinating i've never thought about it like that but when i think about my creativity it is the thing that i must do at every week i must be creative otherwise i feel like i'm trapped mm -hmm. and so then thinking about sexuality piece i want to tap into things that empower me period mm -hmm. and if that happens to be sexuality i'm gonna freaking explore it mm -hmm. it is an important like i think of things of all the superpowers us as women have mm -hmm. that we don't tap into yeah and when i think about sexuality when i think about it's bringing confidence within ourselves it's us knowing our body because how often do we ignore the signs that our bodies are trying to tell us that something's wrong mm -hmm. we just ignore it why because we haven't allowed ourselves time and space to tap into the mm -hmm. signals and when you talk about sexuality if i could be just so blatant right now i was like 15 the first time i took a mirror and actually looked at myself mm -hmm. now at 15, to not know my body well enough, to not understand myself, to not really tap into myself, I think is a missed opportunity for me to really own um, who I want to be, how I show up, how I feel, tap into my emotions, tap into my creativity and everything that you've just said. No, absolutely. And I mean, th this is, we are literally sons of God and goddess embodied in these bodies. So this body is sacred technology that is the housing for your spirit and soul. So 
that again is a click of changing the focus how you eat how you talk to yourself mm -hmm. what energy are you consuming you know everything is is energy whether it's a show you're watching or friends that you keep around you or so that that's a, a big global part of what we're doing here mm -hmm. we're embodying these bodies and these these mechanisms are miraculous it's about coming into communion with yourself at, as you were speaking at these levels and understanding that you know at the moment of climax that you can direct this energy with intention mm -hmm. you can create an altar space right um, so you can prepare a sacred ritual space before you enter in and uh, it can be done either solo or with a conscious partner but you know lots of things like you know offering flowers anointing with oil setting a sacred intention eye gazing being present with mm -hmm. each other um, and you know really understanding what you're dealing with and it, it, there's a lot like it's a whole field of changing because on this planet we have not been interacting with it in a divine way at all god that's so beautiful how much of that and i didn't get to finish uh, really asking you about it earlier where you were saying that you have people look in the mirror mm -hmm. to see themselves so as we start to talk about how we get to know ourselves more i definitely want to make sure that we um we tie that into yeah. your um, badass company and being an independent woman because like as we mm -hmm. go through this identifying self Mm -hmm. through sexuality is so amazing and beautiful and so if you don't mind actually explaining the tactic that you use which you said earlier where you look in the mirror yeah yeah so yeah I'd love to actually this talk is about really it. like for anybody watching if you you know you will you will find such immense transformation in this technique so you just go into a mirror where you can sit in private and you know the light could be low you know and you could have a candle sort of nearby or you know just have low light and just Find a way to relax and, and fix your gaze, you know, be comfortable and start to connect to your breath. So you're going to start to take long, deep fluid inhale, just drawing it up. And then you're going to pause at the top and then you're going to take another exhale and you're just going to let that go. And then you're going to pause at the bottom and then you're going to fix your gaze in the mirror in your third eye point. And you're going to endeavor to keep your eyes open. You can do it with me here. We can do a little right, yeah. thing. So look at my third eye point and then just try to keep your eyes open without freaking out about it, without stressing. And then your eyes will want you, you'll end up blinking them and then just return. Mm. But see if you can stay still in your head and don't move your head and just uh, gaze at that point and breathe, connect to your breath. And you'll start to see some changes happening in my face probably mm -hmm. and you'll start to maybe feel some sensations so if you're doing this with yourself it's quite different than if you're gazing in another so when you do this with yourself we can do this with partners mm -hmm. and yoga and stuff we would do it for a longer time and but if you do this with yourself as a dedicated practice maybe start with five ten minutes a day and just do it do it for 21 days just five or ten minutes that's all and what how does that help then what is that exactly doing to you it will start to reveal the presence that is holding your life mm. so you start to kind of go in and feel feeling yourself and acknowledging your body and connecting mm. it's like a sort of maybe emerging with a witness presence mm. so sometimes in Tantra we call it second attention where I can be talking to you during this interview but my attention is on a greater aspect of who I am. So I'm here, but there is a much greater energy that is activated, mm. I guess you would say. So without giving people, you know, I don't want to interfere with someone's experience, but if you're curious, you should try it because it will clear a lot of either emotion or resistance. Mm. You know, we, we speak so horribly to our beautiful vessels. We're always telling our bodies that they're not quite the right one, that we wish they had blue eyes or brown eyes or that we were curvier or skinnier or younger or whatever it is. And if you and I went to lunch and if we spoke to each other the way that maybe we used to speak to our bodies, 
we probably wouldn't see each other again. But we talk to our own body like that every day. So it's really getting in tune with the fact that you are a sacred technology. Mm -hmm. And how do you want to speak to your body? How do you want to commune with your body? Mm -hmm. And how about just beginning by saying thank you? Like, thank you, I love you. Thank you for everything. And see, it's very, it's very counter because, you know, in spiritual practices or religions, we've been told that we're sinners, that we're not divine, that it's blasphemous to think that you're an aspect of God. But we are nature. We are nature. We don't have to go out into nature. We are nature. Mm. And nature is divine. And we are part of this ecosystem. We are a microcosm of the macrocosm. So it's this click. This is the main click mm. that changes every other experience in life. So this connection to spirituality is the first point. It's not the 25th point. Mm. It's not the thing you do the 100th point. It's the first point. And if you have the first point connected and you always go there, then everything else trickles from there. Then the relationship with yourself, mm. then the relationship with your loved ones, then whatever you're doing. And this is really the basis for Shreema. Click here right now to learn why a woman must never pursue a man and the power she has in walking away. Masculine energy versus feminine energy, they both have assignments. And masculine energy is designed to pursue. Mm. 